For this quick tip, I'd like to talk about something that's a little bit more intermediate to advanced in nature by discussing how to use rest fields whenever you're rendering with Redshift. So let me first of all tell you what I'm trying to do here. We have this smoke, right? And I want to break up the shape of the smoke by using a noise. Well, the answer for that is by using these things called rest fields. And if I go to my pyro sim, I've gone ahead and enabled these rest fields by going to our smoke object and saying under the initial data, add rest field, as well as on our pyro solver, I went to advanced rest field and said enable rest. Now, whenever this uh, simulation is picked up here within this import pyro fields, by middle mouse, we now have our rest X, Y, and Z. And we also have a rest 2 in X, Y, and Z. More on what that's all about here in a little bit. But basically, we have these rest fields. And what these fields do is they store the position of each individual voxel. So our smoke is made up of small little cubes, right, which are voxels. And within those cubes, they store the position data that they live in. And that's what this rest is all about. That's why we have a rest in X, Y, and Z, because that represents our position in space. OK, so why is this position important? And how can we use that to break up our smoke? Well, whenever we create a noise, we want a way for the noise to stick to our smoke, right? And if I throw down a volume VOP here, so I'll just go volume VOP. And let's say that I just throw down a unified noise. This noise is going to be looking for some kind of position. And this position is going to tell the noise how it should basically stick to whatever is in our scene. So anyway, that's where we're going to bring in these rest fields, right? Now, typically, you don't actually do this on the SOP level. If you're using Mantra, the way that this all works is actually already built into the pyro shader. So normally, if you were rendering with Mantra, you would simply go to this pyro shader and just say, enable this noise, and that's all you would have to do. However, with Redshift, the situation is that we don't have that within our shader. So we're actually forced to build it ourselves within the SOP context. So let me show you how you can do that. Go to our volume VOP here. I've uh, already thrown down this unified noise static. And the static simply means that it's going to run a little bit faster based off of how it's compiled and you know all that. But basically, just use a unified noise static. Go to the top. Set the signature here to a 3D dual rest 1D noise. I know that this is going to be a 1D noise because our density exists as one value. It's not like a vector, which is a series of three values. It's just one value, which is why it's a 1D. We have that, and now we need to bring in our rest fields. So for this, I'm going to set a bind. And let's call this rest. I'm going to duplicate that and say rest ratio. And then let's bring in our other rest fields. So let's call this rest2 and then rest to ratio. For our rest, we need to set the type here to vector so that we are dealing with a collection of three values, x, y, z. Our ratio is going to be a float, and rest two is going to be a vector as well. OK, so we have our rest. Now, how do we take that rest and somehow translate it into a position that our noise can understand? Well, for that, we need this thing called a dual rest solver. And with this, we will plug in our rest right there, our bound rest, and so on and so forth. Now, the reason why we have two rest fields is because over time, these rest positions are going to trade off with each other. The reason why they're trading off is because we don't want our noise getting distorted as our smoke moves. We actually want our noise to kind of move around a little bit and then switch back to where it was before so that we don't have these long streaks over time. Anyway, don't worry about that too much. Just know that you have to have a dual rest solver. There's 
two rest fields. Let's set that into our position. And now we have a way of applying a noise. So we're going to multiply this against our density. We'll go like that. And now if I plug this into our main density, we are now affecting our volume. I'm going to set this to a manual update as I change these unified noise parameters, because it's kind of slow. If I go here to a standard FBM, this is going to uh, basically just add a little bit more detail to what we're doing here. I'm also going to add bias and gain. And for the bias, I'll set this to 0.3, which means take our gray values and make them darker. And then our gain is going to be 0.8, which basically just means, hey, add more contrast. Gray values should either be more white or more black. And so the result of setting all that is now we can more easily see that this noise is breaking up our shape, like so. Last but not least, I'm going to set down a mix node. And with this mix node, I'm going to mix between the result of our noise and our original density. Now, if I promote the bias here, I'll just promote this, and let's call this our volume mix. Well, let's actually call this our volume noise mix. There we go. That's even better. Volume noise mix. I go to the top here. What you'll notice is that if I set this mix to zero and I refresh, we are left with just our pure noise results. If I set this to one, we are left with our unaffected original density. So for this, I'm going to set it to 0.5, refresh, and there we go. Now we have something that's kind of in between. We're still breaking up the shapes a little bit, but it's not as drastic. Now, whenever you go to cache this out, my recommendation is that once you're done using these rest fields, go ahead and set a delete stop and get rid of anything that you don't need at that point. So in this case, I want to delete everything that has rest. And well, you get the idea. By doing that, it's going to reduce the file size of our cache files. And uh, then we're good to go. If you enjoyed this lesson, be sure to support what I do by subscribing, liking, uh, as well as checking out my other courses, which you can find at cgcircuit.com. I've also included a link to those in the video's description. Thanks for watching.